coalition, which is next week. Hello, welcome viewers and listeners. We thank you for joining us. We know your time is valuable. Uh, we are going to de de deconstruct an article written by Natalie Wexler, who uh, has written the article for Forbes, but Wexler is also the author of two books, uh, The Writing Revolution and The Knowledge Gap. Her writing is outstanding. I am a huge fan. The title of the article that Judy Faith and I will discuss is New Podcast Examines Why Teachers Have Been Sold a Story on Reading Instruction. So what is the podcast? Why is it titled Sold a Story? Go ahead. So uh, I'll jump in. So um, it's called Sold a Story because according to the podcast and um, according to people who have been in the trenches during this time period, there were basically um, four major players involved in why uh, instruction leans toward guided reading and um, you know the workshop model. And although Hanford did not mention them by name at the beginning, most people in this reading world know that she was talking about Marie Clay, uh, Fontes and Pinnell and Lucy Calkins. And the reason it's called Soul to Story is because there's an element of deception or at least according to how the podcast was presented, that there is this element of deception that these players uh, who were uh, experts in the field or at least perceived experts in the field, all knew about the science at one point or another, even Mari Clay, who, um, did this well before the research, but once she knew about the research, decided to stick to her guns and still continue to use strategies where science um, um, proved that perhaps that uh, there were better ways of teaching kids. So that's why it's called Soul to Story because these players continue to push strategies that uh, could be harmful to kids. And we're going to talk about those strategies, but I do wanna say in the article, um, Natalie uh, Wexler mentioned that they could have easily, well, Hanford could have easily talked about other elements of reading other than phonics. But my feeling is then it would have been called sold to bridge because that would have made this into way more than six episodes. So it might be larger than phonics, but certainly um, how much can you put in this? And phonics was a clear path to show the deception. That's my opinion. Judy, what do you think? So as you all know, um, for the last five or six years, I've been kind of obsessed with following the research and the science. Um, I'm trained in Orton Gillingham, an expert in foundations, uh, Hegarty, and all those other programs. However, I think that every story always has two sides, and there's other people that may feel differently. I think the key is to think about best practices. Does the research show that all kids will do better with the foundational skills and, and the phonics uh, program a thousand and one percent but I think when reading recovery was designed and I'm not embarrassed to say that years ago I was trained in it that was the hottest ticket in town it was a grant by Obama and it was told to us that it's the strongest program in town and this is going to be a game changer and you know some of the elements were really powerful and I think that unless somebody was trained in the methods you don't fully know like there was Elkonin boxes, which is totally a phonemic awareness skill. Then there was Elkonin boxes where you have to put the letters so it transitions into phonics. Then it, through that gradual release model, it switched from just um, spelling uh, spelling boxes where you put all the letters, like if the word was speak, you're going to learn about the vowel teams. However, this was a really big missing piece for me. 
The missing piece for me was that we never learned phonics as experts. And I only really learned all the syllable types and how to decode multisyllabic words really well and explain it to kids about six years ago. But I've been in this business of education for 25 years. That was a really critical piece that I feel was missing. And I can definitely tell you, some kids did not discontinue because looking at the first letter wasn't enough. Looking at the picture, as we all know, is not a best practice. You know, for even for years, I've shifted in that. Look at the word as your first course of action and slide through point of difficulty. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, and I and I can mention it, but I don't want to take everybody's time. So let's uh, have somebody else speak. You know what I what I love about Wexler's point is she she makes the argument in here that there is nothing dry or didactic lectures yes. about uh, the podcast. I found myself completely taken in with the podcast. Yeah. And, and I want to say Emily Hanford has done really great work in illuminating this critical crisis in our country with low literacy. And because she's written it in very palatable ways that people understand, she's she's brought a lot more people into the arena. Um, here's a little tidbit from Wexler's article. Uh, in the first episode, Hanford promises to explain why a company and its top authors have been able to peddle a wrong idea about reading instruction for so long. Again, there's a lot of gravitas to that. Why have they been allowed to peddle a reading instructional program for so long? By the end of episode two, the company has yet to be named, although along with the three of its four authors, and Wexler makes an educated guess that the company is Heinemann. And for those of you that are not familiar, Heinemann is an educational publishing company that's been around for decades. Heinemann is the leading publisher and the authors of uh, Marie Clay, uh, Fountas and Pinnell and Lucy Calkins. So they would be considered Fountas, Pinnell, Calkins, Marie Clay, what Wexler calls the mothers of balanced literacy. And unfortunately, because so little attention was paid to phonics, we have uh, a, a huge reading crisis in our country. And who's been left behind mostly? The low income people. So I think we need to really address what um, Wexler was talking about as far as that this was a missed opportunity on Hanford's part to discuss something more than just phonics because it is, reading is way more than phonics, right? There are other aspects. I posted today about vocabulary. It was just something that came up with one of my students. Uh, parents showed me a list of words that were sent home. And basically the parent was expected to just drill those words. And then the kid would be tested at the end of the week. And certainly that's not a best practice either. And it has nothing to do with phonics. So there are missing pieces overall in reading vocabulary. There's this content knowledge piece. There is, um, you know, the ability to be able to hold information together as you're reading. We know it's way more than phonics. But the question is, was this the place to start talking about all of those things? I think that is the question. In my mind, when Wexler said uh, she just barely scratched the surface, well, yes, it could go way deeper, but I think the sexy story here, and of course, all journalists are interested in a sexy story, it gets attention. The sexy story here is a story of deception. That to me is why she focused on this piece because it's tangible. It was something where they actually 
kept the information from the public, tried to hide it so that they could keep pushing their program, making their money, keeping this political power and control machine going. That's how I feel about this. Not to say Wexler was wrong, because I certainly think reading has a lot more parts, but I don't think Hanford would be able to cover it well in six episodes if she went into all of these other areas. It's the dangerous part. Wexler did make a very, very good point. However, I think she was also saying, we can't just look at phonics. We have to look at all the pillars of literacy and also writing. Because what I'm seeing lately with working with kids and so forth, there's kids that can read, but then they can't even write a word like said. So they have to go hand in hand with explicit instruction. But the other thing is, you know, we need to look at the whole literacy block. What does that look like? Okay, so some schools have been doing foundations or another phonics program for 30 minutes. I, does that guarantee that the test scores are gonna go up, up, up? No. So every school seems to be at a different place. Some schools have core knowledge and then they have foundations, which is science aligned. Some schools have TC still, and then they have foundations. So, you know, it's very hard to look at data because so many different things are going on in so many schools. And I think the most dangerous part for me is that many schools, teachers are rated directly on how kids did on the benchmark literacy, either TC running records or FMP running records. So right now I feel like a lot of teachers and administrators are getting a mixed message. Let's move to decodables. Let's, um, we're gonna do the science of reading. We're gonna do Acadians. We're gonna look at oral reading fluency. However, your rating depends on how they did on leveled literacy assessments, running records. So Problematic, <laughs> and I think Wexler, was thinking about that. This is an opportunity. The world has a problem. How are we going to fix it this time so that we have success? Because guess what? Phonics was in style when I first started teaching a while back, I don't want to tell, over 20 years ago. All of a sudden it disappeared. Why? So Why? Judy, would you please tell you? We have We have a lot of people who have no idea what you're talking about with running records, or will you please explain what you're talking about as far as children and benchmarking? All right, so I know Faith might chime in when I mention her uh, pet peeve with balanced literacy. Yeah, I know it's ready. Mine doesn't work, but it's ready. But okay, so running records were basically a tool that you would listen to a kid read. And that is a beautiful thing to listen to a kid read. That's a very critical thing. And you got to see what behaviors they had. Are they pointing? Are they sliding through words at points of difficulty? But research is finding that the flaw in that was, and not everybody was doing this, but that you were doing an MSB model, which is miscue Q analysis, right? You were looking and to see, are they using meaning? Are they using structure or syntax? Are they using visual print? What it so it's a strength, it was designed as a strength based model. But if you taught to that model and ignored teaching kids how to look at visual print and how to decode words, that model kind of missed the boat a little bit. But and meaning is, is, but meaning is very important. So I don't think the intention was as bad as everybody thinks in this world, but well, I think that you know, well, I think. You, you know, I want to wanna, I wanna get to this point because I think it's really the nugget of the whole article. Yeah. Mari Clay, so, so Hanford states in her podcast that in 1978, they have a, a clip where Mari Clay, who's a researcher, tells people we don't know what's going on with the brain and reading, and we probably never will. But here's the news flash for all of you that are not in education. And some of you that are that don't know this. Brain research is real. It's out there. There are really smart people who have written great books about the research and they've done MRIs, specific MRIs on people's brain. And they know exactly which areas of the brain are light up and the brain's letterbox. What happens in the brain, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but that we do know, definitively we do know 
what okay. happens in the brain. And we know that people have to be explicitly taught. Okay. So there was a lot just said there. You know, dun, dun, dun. And right. And a lot to unpack. So first thing, when someone does a running record, not only are you looking at miscues, um, in other words, the mistakes that kids make based on the context, they are also reading some words correctly based on the context. So we assume that those kids actually could read those same words when uh, you know it's out of the context. And what we see is they can't. Thank All you. right, so that's the inherent problem with a running record. It assumes too much. It assumes that kids, even if they're getting the words right and it wasn't a miscue, that they actually could read those same words in isolation. That's number one. That's what's very wrong. Number two, I want to say that I think that Mari Clay did not do something intentionally to her. Yeah. I want to put that out there that when she did this in the 70s, I truly think that her research at the time was revolutionary. As um, Dr. Sam in our group mentioned, um, he was talking about, you know, the good. And the good is that there was finally a point in time where we tried to make scientific judgments about kids. Unfortunately, what she did was not science. It was observation and it was reading into observations because we didn't, as Mary just said, we didn't have the ability to get inside a kid's brain. So there were a lot of assumptions made about what good readers do when it was really, that's what poor readers do. So there were a lot of misunderstandings along the way. So I don't blame Mari Clay for that. I do, however, think it was poor judgment on her part when she was asked by the government to maybe try to revise her program at the time. And she did not want to revise it. What she answered was reading recovery will stay the same. We will make it fit the description of what the government wants. So that to me says, all right, that's intentional, but that's the only thing, and I think this was years later, and that was somebody who was holding on to her baby. She wanted to keep it true to what she believed. But I do think in this whole reporting that the other three players, Fontes, Pinnell, and Calkins, absolutely knew the research. They were associated with universities, Ohio State and Columbia, an Ivy League school. You can't right. tell me that these smart women had no idea what the research was over 20 years ago. They made a decision to fight back to hold their power and control and their place in the reading world. And unfortunately, we were sold the Brooklyn Bridge. That's really what happened, even though this is purely focusing on one aspect of reading. So when reading, this is what we were told many, many, many years ago. We were told that the program was designed, meaning reading recovery, for a classroom where they're doing tons of phonics and the kid is still not getting it. Now, yes, we know now maybe that child needs phonics or, or phonemic awareness help in a tier two intervention, whether it be Wilson or just words and so forth. But I don't think the intention was to make it a program for all. And that's the direction it went into. But, it, you know, reading recovery, I haven't done it in years. It's out of style in, in a lot of schools. However, there were pieces that focused a little bit on the science. There was the Elkonin boxes, the spelling boxes, then there was the cut-ups, right? You would write, a sentence would be written, it would be the child's sentence. And then, you know, if the child was working on suffixes, we would cut the word. If it was jumped, you have ju jump, jumped, right? So that could be, a, that was a strategic part of the science and rereading and it integrated a lot of things. There was also an activity known as breaking words where we, there, it was pretty short. But, you know, some of my trainers showed us how to do it at a deeper level. So I think the imbalance was some people were very focused on the visual, but some people were stuck in the meaning, you know, rely on meaning. But you can't always rely on meaning and you can't always rely on a picture because I had a lot of ENL students, English 
language learners, and that word wasn't very familiar to them. They don't know the word repeated, right? But if they knew the phonics elements of how to decode that word, that there's a vowel team in there, that there's a suffix in there, they may have been very much more successful. The last thing that reading recovery had was interactive writing. Interactive writing is a very, very powerful tool in a lot of classrooms where you're writing stuff and the students are helping you and they're filling in the first letter, the last letter, the spelling the word, tapping the word. So we can't paint this picture that it was the worst thing on all in the world for every aspect. There were some good practices that even though now I became an expert in the science of reading, I felt really good about those practices. And the other thing that was really good about reading recovery, and this is the way I interpret it, we were trained on how to teach kids certain behaviors, what to do at point of difficulty, modeling sliding through the word. Kids don't just don't know that if they're learning phonics and you don't show them how to decode, how to slide through words, how to point to words in earlier levels, you know, that that's valuable. And that's part of the gradual release model where I want you to do something. I want you to look at that vowel team. I want you to slide through it. So kids need that modeling. And that's where I learned how to show kids what to do instead of looking at me or looking at the picture. No. So I want to go back thought. to the article. Um, Wexler also makes the point that brain research has been slow to make its way into uh, our, our, our education. Uh, so schools are not, teachers by and large don't know about uh, what happens in the brain while someone reads. It's totally essential to know. Uh, there are state directors and federal people who, who don't know the brain science either. So she said, this is really, unfortunately, the information has been slow to penetrate schools of education and instructional materials designed to teach kids how to read. So if you're a university professor, you really need to get on this. This is another really uh, important quote that Wexler makes. Uh, balanced literacy and its similar predecessor, whole language, have left us with a staggering number of citizens who are not only unable to uh, do the kind of reading that enables them to hold down well-paying jobs, but also understand any newspaper and magazine articles. Democracies cannot function without a reasonably literate citizenry. And only about, now hold on to your chairs for this one, only 54% of American adults and 54% of American adults read below a sixth grade level. That's half of our nation reads below a sixth grade level. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I think the three of us know. I'm not even touching my bullshit button for yeah. that one. I'm, I'm, I'm behaving, I'm behaving. So, um, yeah, and that's exactly what it says in there. And um, many of us in the field certainly know that. And it runs across all demographics. So um, certainly uh, low income people hit hardest, but it really does run across all demographics. Um, but I also wanna make a point of saying this, how Wexler ends the article, I think is probably one of the most important points that we need to discuss. And that was, she wanted to say that basically Hanford could have spoken about all the areas of reading. And it was a missed opportunity. And here's what she said, uh, why we should talk about all these areas. Why? Because at some point after kids have gotten good phonics instruction, we're likely to discover that many of them can decode words in complex text, but can't understand the text. At that point, the phonics skeptics may well say, you see, Phonics doesn't work. Right. And the right. pendulum will swing back to something like balanced literacy or whole language, perhaps under yet another name. And I just want to address that because um, I do think that 
you know, there are so many weaknesses in leveled reading. That I agree. Obviously, the, the phonics part is one piece of it that now Calkins is revising because she has to. There's just too much evidence and too much public pressure. And that's why she has to start doing something right. about it. But she's making but, money again. She's uh, making money always again. making money. She didn't revise it without saying, you know what? I'm going to give this to school yep. and right. teachers. No, she's right. charging $700 a teacher to fix mistakes. So this is not just like when there's a car problem and they say, oh yeah, you know what? We, we we'll take care of it. We know it was our mistake. We'll take care of it. No, she's making the schools pay for her mistakes. All right. Which to me is outrageous. I agree but, on that point. You know, but I got to say that as far as um, this idea that this pendulum will swing back, if we just have good phonics instruction, well, you know what? That was the whole idea of getting something like foundations in all these schools, right? The problem is we never removed the level literacy. We did right. this simultaneously and did not reinforce the phonics with decodable books. So kids were getting these mixed messages. And yeah. that's why reading first, because of all the political pressure, never did what it was supposed to. And I could attest to that because I was right in there as a regional literary, literacy coach during reading first. So, and I saw that we were going into schools where they took the money in reading first, but did not go through with the science of reading the way it was meant to be. So it was right. done correctly in the first place. So how do we avoid this from happening? I think we need to discuss that. One of you jump in and tell me and I'll tell you what I think. So well, I think, oh yeah, go Mary, go Mary. So phonics, phonics, what I love, uh, we all know, but we're gonna make it clear to our viewers and listeners, Phonics will not help you understand what you're reading. Well, I it, it can. Well, it, it it's a dynamic oh. fluid process, but it's not about it. Of course, they're all interwoven, but teaching phonics alone, this is the caveat that she addresses. If we focus on phonics, 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 that doesn't mean that kids are going to understand vocabulary. It doesn't right. mean that they're going to understand what they're reading. So it's a it's a process, everybody, that really begins before a baby is born. I ran into a person in the park. I lost my phone the other day in the park while I was walking my dogs. And um, I wanted to pay this person for helping me find, find uh, my phone. And she had a little granddaughter with her. And I asked her, oh, does she like reading? And um, I said, well, you know what? Take the money and I want you to buy some books with it. Uh, re language vocabulary is beginning from the moment of birth. So the more you talk to a child, the more you, you explain, you know, what's happening with the leaves in autumn, all of that goes into the reading rope that goes into what kids are understanding. So just, so if I were able to break the code in Russian, so I put up a post on my page uh, a few months back when I was at an international airport and it was all in Russian. And they speak Russian. I can't read it. But even if I could break the code, Judy, I doubt I would understand it because I don't understand cultural practices, cultural norms. I would have to have a lot of background building. Um, so, so this whole thing about we only do phonics is, 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 not, is not correct. And we talked about that with Shanahan uh, on an article that he wrote. So um, I love what Hanford's doing. I think I, I agree with you both that taking on the whole Magilla for, for Hanford would have been too much. Um, but I find her podcast riveting. And I, I, urge, uh, I urge all school leaders and state leaders to listen in. And thanks again to Natalie Wexler because uh, her writing is phenomenal, and she makes complete sense uh, in her articles and books. Judy, your thoughts? So some thoughts. Are we wrapping up, ladies? 
Well, this my final good. Well, just All right, say so, what you have to, and then I'm going to jump in. So I think what both of you said is really, really important. I think just teaching phonics in isolation is not going to get the results that we want. Kids need to learn how to transfer those skills in reading, in writing. And, you know, I actually had more of a problem with the TC writing program because it said write more and more and more and more. And yes, it was fun for some kids. I'm doing a how-to today or I'm doing a personal narrative. But think about this. A kid is sitting there writing five pages of something, okay? <laughs> and, he was, and he or she was barely given any feedback, barely any explicit instruction on how to start, how to write a topic sentence, how to write a conclusion. No, go write more and more and more and more. And there's one teacher in a classroom. Okay, boys and girls, we're now done. So you made 75 mistakes and didn't get any feedback on your spelling or on your content or your organization. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's really, really not okay. Joy is joy, but it's really not fun for a kid that can't spell to sit there and write five pages. And it's happening in classrooms a lot. Now, there was another thing. We could do Still, a whole episode on writing instruction. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, writing revolution changed my life. But anyway, I really feel strongly we need to still focus on the entire literacy block. What does it look like from start to finish? Because guess what? I've seen schools that are doing foundations and doing it really well. But when I ask some kids to read a passage from what was formerly known as Dibbles or Acadians now, and they're given an oral uh, reading fluency task, a lot of those kids still can't read. So there is no guarantee that if 30 minutes of our day is shifted to phonics, that we're gonna have excellent results. The other thing is, I wish, I wish, I wish that somebody would show us really strong data in high performing schools and how they did that. A, a school that totally embraced the science. Where are you guys? Let's see it, talk about it. That would make me feel better because I care that much. Okay, well, again, Judy, you said a lot. Mary, you said a lot. I think, first of all, you could be seeing poor results because many of those schools did not have decodable books. Right. So let's put it this way. Just because you have foundations in, Foundations was um, sold, the schools were sold a story with Foundations too, And the story, oh, God. Got, oh yes, they were. They were sold a story that if you just add in, if you I just agree add with in you. Foundations, mm -hmm. that's enough. And Barbara Wilson never really said, well, don't combine it with level literacy. It was basically, if you just add this in, you're covering all Oh, the so I see what you're saying. You're saying also, it well, let me just finish. Let me yep. just finish that I think that we traditionally have added in programs without taking away what's wrong. And Ooh. so people add in Hegarty, they add in foundations, they add in lots and lots of things. And then they wonder why they don't get the results that they want. But Bingo. they never look at the whole picture and they don't take away what doesn't work or what could actually lead kids into the wrong direction, which leads me to the other piece of this. Will it be a problem for schools to say, okay, phonics, 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 and keep level literacy? I think yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, it is a problem to have both of these. But I would think, unlike what Natalie Wexler said, when the pendulum will swing back, I think if teachers know what works in phonics and they say, well, what happened here? We did so well, we are doing an excellent job with phonics and kids still can't read. Now that we know more holistically about the reading process, it should open up questions for schools and say, well, why is that? Do we have these other pieces? What are we using? If we're using leveled books and kids are getting a daily diet of something from a low level, how could their comprehension or vocabulary ever grow? 
that should be the next question. So I don't think that this reporting needed to go into that piece, but I do think that school districts need to start conversations and realize that this reporting does scratch the surface. I do think she's right. It does scratch the surface. There is something deeper, but I don't think you were able to address everything, but it should open up a conversation as is, that's why I wrote my books, okay? I, there was a reason for failing students or failing schools. When I wrote that, it was from my experience having been a regional literacy coach during Reading First, doing this now for 35 years in education, seeing programs come and go, and seeing that it's a much bigger conversation. So I, you know, I just wanted to put that out there that I think it was a really good article. I think they both brought up very good points, but no, I don't think by focusing on deception and that's what this was about, deception. Are we supposed to trust these women and this publishing company to make decisions for the millions of kids out there? I say, no, we should not. Well, you know, that same company just came out with um, HMH, which is actually on the um, on the approving list of um, research based programs. So they do have other programs, but they're selling different things. Different people want different things, but it shouldn't be that way. Every kid right now needs a literacy block that is evidence based. That's how I feel. That's and, how I feel. And you know the the other thing is though I would say to Judy and Faith that if you do teach phonics systematically, explicitly, almost everybody, about 90% of the people will learn to break the code. So if it's, it's not gonna say, we're gonna try it, it's not working, oh my gosh, it's not working. If it's followed sequentially, explicitly, it will happen. Um, this was another part, I think when you say deception faith, it's, it's like such a great nugget of a word because 16% of K through two students in our country are still using units of study written by Lucy Hawkins and published by Heinemann, 16%. So think about the thousands of children that translates to, the thousands and thousands of whom 40% will not learn to read that way. And it, I agree completely. You cannot, you cannot dovetail both of these things and have balanced literacy and also the decodables and, and try to do that. You, you have to be clear on what your path is. What do you want the end result? And my final thought is if we have, and I want to get this statistic right, but if we have uh, almost half of our population not able to read at a sixth grade level, guess what? All the crap that we've been doing for the last 30 years, a lot of it has not worked when you have a success rate of only 50%. Those are my final thoughts. Judy, final thoughts? So final th thoughts. For me, as always, it's about best practices. And I've had to revisit some of the practices I've done in the past and I had to say goodbye because I'm following the science. I think there were great things that I learned in the past. Balanced literacy didn't look the same in every single school, but the balance wasn't well balanced. Our data is low countrywide. And, you know, it's okay to rethink things and change what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, science is changing. We have to look forward and, you know, who knows, Marie Clay, she passed away, right? So we're hearing old, you know, tape recordings of what she said. Who knows, maybe if she was here today, she would be saying things like me, that we have to shift, that, you know, maybe using those picture cues wasn't the best idea. Maybe focusing on the visual print a little bit more or a lot more would have been great, you know? But, you know, a lot of the things you, you guys have been saying to me for a while really make sense. like. Why is in a level A book, there's words like bicycle or words like tame with the silent E, you know? That's not really helpful to a lot of kids who are just learning how to decode. 
So I have to admit, for a lot of the early readers, I am shifting. I have a whole decodable library. And just to see if what you guys are saying is really true, sometimes I'll pull out a level book because I didn't throw them all out yet. And guess what? The little six-year-old that I was working with, the second I put out a level book, the guessing or the looking at the first letter or relying on meaning comes back. But the second I switch to those red books, I forgot what company it is. Um, they're really good. Um, he start, the same child starts to slide through the words. Is it easy? No. And Tim Rosinski mentioned something also on his page. The fluency piece is very hard with decodable text in the beginning stages because, you know, it kids are working. Be. It should uh, be. Right. But eventually, if that, but even when it's hard, when that child is rereading the sentence, he decoded it, he goes back to reread it and sound more like, you know, fluent. So I think this is a great opportunity for both science of reading people, balanced literacy people, centrist people. Let's come together. Let's talk like we do at the Literacy View. Do we always agree? No, but we're talking about it. And the best thing that could happen is you go home, you close your eyes, you start thinking, you wake up and you try something new to help kids. I love, I love that final closing thought because that is the purpose of this podcast, this YouTube, is to get people thinking. The three of us do not have all the answers. What we do have is experience and we have a passion for this and we wanna share that with you and we wanna hear what you have to say. My final thought is, you know, as far as Marie Clay, I don't wanna go backwards, but she did have an opportunity to change and didn't. So I don't know where she would be now. My assumption is she would have been forced up against a wall like Hawkins to have to do something to kind of keep herself relevant. That's my feeling. Be that as it may, you know, making assumptions at this point really doesn't matter. We can only go by what we see in front of us. And my, my last thoughts really are that school districts need to ask the right questions. And that if we're learning anything from these podcasts and articles, it's that journalists are not teachers. They are not in the schools. They have no experience working with struggling readers. They are observers. They are watching and writing and they want sexy stories so that people will read what they write and listen to what they have to say. We are people in the trenches. We are those people who work with these struggling kids every day and have the experience and the knowledge. And we can reflect on our practices. And we are asking school districts to do the same, that you can listen to this podcast, you can listen to Hanford, you can read Wexler and their articles. But in the end, what we are really asking you to do is to think why kids have not moved in 30 years. That's the bottom line. Well said, well said. Thank you. And I thank, we thank Natalie Wexler for, uh, for writing her article and it's been an honor to discuss her article and, um, and to Emily Hanford for creating the podcast. So we hope you tune in and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Literacy View, and you can find our podcast anywhere you get podcasts and it's titled The Literacy View. So and join you. us on Facebook too, The Literacy View. Bye and now. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time.